Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're going to Dr. Steve Pachenik right now, of course. Dr. Pachenik is an American psychiatrist, a former State Department official for four administrations. He certainly understands what's going on there. He's had 20 years experience with that. Of course, he's also a co-creator of the best-selling Tom Clancy Op Center and NetForce paperback series. And Dr. Pachenik, before the election, became very outspoken, and he would come onto our show very frequently, and we wouldn't have pictures of him, but he came out before the election saying, this is a coup against the globalists. And so, Dr. Pachenik, I want to ask you, is there a counter coup going on now in the White House? What do you make of all this? Well, I think that what is important to understand, David, is two elements in this. Number one, in order to refresh your memory and your audience's memory, I was involved with our military intelligence about eight, nine years ago, just before the Syrian civil war, when I literally went into Syria and Bashar Assad and his people interrogated me and then allowed me to travel all over the country for 18 days. What I came out of that was, and I reported this to my uh, contacts in military intelligence, was a very simple point that Bashar Assad was not going to leave. And I had also worked against Hafez Assad, his father. So I understood very well that Hafez Assad, Bashar Assad, the all Alawite community, which is a minority community in Syria, would still dominate a predominantly Sunni country. What happened subsequently was that Assad was not very effective in handling what was really a water war. And the people from Homs and Hama came up and they were Sunnis and they protested the handling of the water distribution of food subsequently. Anyway, what subsequently happened is that our intelligence community through the uh, CIA and other elements of the civilian part created ISIS and Al-Qaeda and you've talked about it. But the most important part was that our military understood very clearly what it was that I was saying and understood that there was no way we were going to be in the business of regime changing. Having said that, I understand a little bit about uh, General McMaster and even General Mattis. And I think the important thing to remember in, in both these gentlemen and also the surrounding facts is that President Trump initiated this strike just at the moment when Kim Jong, uh, when Kim Ji Pong, the president of, uh, I'm sorry, when President Xi Jinping of China was literally at the doorstep of Mardo Lago. And he did this, and I think our military did it, for very important reasons. Number one, it was a very clear message to President Xi, more than to anybody else, more than Russia, more than uh, the ISIS or anybody else that listened. You, President Xi, you were involved in violence during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. You don't like violence. We don't like violence. But if you have any question as to the resolve of a president, i.e. Trump, as opposed to Obama or anyone else, let me reassure you that I will order a strike against some base, air base, which is not as relevant as anybody thinks, and it will be done in your presence. I think President Xi Jinping was absolutely stunned by what he saw and what he realized. That message that was sent to President Xi Jinping was also translated to, uh, to Prime Minister and President and CEO of North Korea, Kim Jong-un who has been playing around with nuclear weapons as a way of creating some leverage for negotiation. Our only negotiation, quite frankly, is through China. China can and can literally suppress anything that North Korea wants to do. Our military does not want to go into North Korea. They don't want to do preemptive action. They don't want to go into a war in Syria. Our military does not want to follow the neocons, even though some neocons correctly came in, but they were thrown out. Thanks to Alex Jones, myself and others. Elliot Abrams didn't come in. A whole bunch of others didn't come in. But when we're talking about our generals, McMaster, who wrote The Dereliction of Duty, we're talking about general matters. They understood very clearly that war is not the solution to what our problem is. What 
is a solution is what I call the kabuki of war. In other words, we will show you what we're capable of doing at the right time in the right place. So the Syrian so-called attack was really done not for Syria, not for Russia. All of them were cleared beforehand. Russia understood this was happening. Turkey was informed. Uh, every country was informed. Saudi Arabia, Israel, even Syria and Bashar Assad understood it. But the only people who were not informed was President Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un. What this means now is that the matrix of negotiation with the president of China and North Korea has suddenly shifted to our advantage. For 20 to 30 years, I've been involved with North Korea. And quite frankly, it's been frustrating. I've been held back on my capability to do regime change because I knew exactly how to take down the North Koreans. The greatest fear China has and has been a fear for the United States for the past 30 years, but has not been my fear, is the fact that we can literally destabilize the borders of North Korea. We can do it militarily, we can do it economically, we can do it politically. What Trump was doing and what the generals were doing was saying, look, we're not going to get into the business of attacking North Korea. We're not going to get into the business of destabilizing your borders. But if you don't change your behavior, we can assure you that we have the willpower to do whatever is necessary to inculcate and to execute whatever actions we need. So, in effect, this whole scenario was never uh, really done for Syria or for the Middle East. We're not interested in the Middle East, quite frankly. We're pulling away from the Middle East, even though we're sending in some soldiers to finish up the work in, in Raqqa and Mosul, but for the most part, we're going to be shifting to the Asia, to southern China, which is what I wrote about 20 years ago, the Spratly Islands. So in some ways, David, you have to look back at this as a very clever way of the art of the deal. In other words, everybody was looking to Syria, where at the same time, I was looking at Kim Jong-un, and I was looking at President Xi Jinping. Now, President Xi Jinping is very smart. This is not a warlord. This is a gentleman who lost his father and, and by humiliation of Mao Zedong. He understands what fighting is. He understands what personally being beaten up means about. He understands that we can ruin the Chinese economy at will. He understands that we can destroy their water capacity. He understands that we can destroy the infrastructure. But he doesn't want this. On the other hand, the Chinese have maintained their Middle Kingdom complex, which means we can do no wrong in China. And you, you are the peasants and you are the gaijin or the foreigners who have to come to us. What President Trump did was to turn the table around psychologically and said, you know what? Now let's negotiate. Now, let me understand what you understood in terms of my action. And he did this in a scenario which is totally inappropriate for a war scenario. And that is a beautiful banquet with the gorgeous women, with wine and all the accoutrements of, 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 of uh, the rich. But at the same time, the point was made and President Xi Jinping understood it very quickly, as did all his generals, that this is not a time to play with this president or this country. Well, number one, I don't know Mr. Tillerson. I know he was recommended by uh, James Baker and Condoleezza Rice. Uh, I think Mr. Tillerson is smart enough to know that he has never been in the business of regime change. What he has been in the, is the business of business. So I think he kind of played out the orchestration of saying that we are, in fact, uh, you know, really looking as if we're going to change the regime. But we're not in the business of regime change. There's no one here in this administration who has actually had regime change. I'm not part of it. I, I, you know, I've known others who've been involved in regime change. This is not an administration that could literally go into regime change. And regime change does not mean that you can get into war and get rid of a Bashar Assad. It's just not going to happen. Number one, he controls about 60 to 70 percent of the country. He comes from an area that's called Latakia. And if you've been in that area, which I have been, 
not only the women are beautiful, but there are signs all over the place which says do not wear any scarves. And so Alawites are very secular, and he will remain there until there is some kind of tripartite or an agreement between Russia, Turkey, Iran, and ourselves to literally change the uh, administration in, in Syria, make it peaceful as much as we can, do reparations, and then Turkey, despite Erdogan's great so your comments about uh, you know Syria as well as what you see happening within the uh, Trump White House, is there a, well, a move in there? Yes. Thank you, David. Number one, in Syria, there will be no regime change. When we announce a regime change, that means we can't do it. Uh, when I was involved in a regime change in the Soviet Union, they didn't know what was happening. It occurred over the Nixon-Reagan administration. We took them down very quietly. In terms of the White House, what's happening is... General McMaster, who actually we, I had funded him uh, in the 90s when he did arm care for the Tom Clancy series, is a very serious uh, scholar warrior. And he understood right away that Steve Bannon was not privy and not really capable of dealing with the issues of strategy and tactics, even though uh, Steve has been in the Navy and I have full respect for what he's done. The issue of national security was exceedingly important and had to belong sui generis to him. Another element that, McF that McMaster did, and it was not really covered, was that a, a lady named McFarland was thrown out as well. Now, I knew about her, although I didn't know her, from the Nixon administration. She was not a top-notch analyst. She was not that well regarded, and uh, McMaster acted accordingly by getting her out and sending her to Singapore. So in effect, what McMaster is doing is solidifying his base and bringing in professional operatives. The last person who has to be taken out is this gentleman named Ezra Cohn Watnick, a friend of Jared Kushner, who has no experience whatsoever, a Jewish guy who graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and is head of intelligence. That's just not acceptable. Uh, I have worked with and against the CIA, but I have full respect for the history of the CIA and our, our community of intelligence, 17 different units. But this man Cohen has no experience. Neither does Jared Kushner. And these individuals should not be involved in foreign affairs, let alone in domestic uh, concerns. I know Jared Kushner and his building 666 Fifth Avenue is going bankrupt. So I think his time should be spent on re, uh, mortgaging his buildings and not in the White House. That's my opinion. However, I am in full favor of what McMaster did. I'm in full favor in the fact that uh, Bannon has to take a secondary role, control his narcissism. He knows that, as does Trump, and he will do that. But he has to focus in on exactly what his accomplishments are. We're still waiting for the $1 trillion infrastructure project. I was not impressed by the medical bills that came through. I was not impressed with any of the Republicans, including Rand Paul, because nobody had read the bill and nobody understood right. what it was really about. Well, how would you address that to Trump's disgruntled base? And well, we've got 20 I'm seconds. I'm trying to do it right now through the Alex Jones show. What I'm saying is, let's see what happens. Basically, this is not an initiation to war. And the reason it's very simple. I don't care what Elliot Abrams says. I know Elliot. I stopped him from coming in. I stopped John Bolton from uh, Your comments to, to wrap this up, and then we're going to go to uh, Dr. Jerome Corsi. Dr. Dr. Pachinik. Uh, basically, Elliot Abrams and John Bolton are, are sycophants. I've known them for four different administrations. They avoided the draft. They can't serve our military. Elliot Abrams comes from a left-wing Trotskyite family. Uh, John Bolton he admitted he didn't want to go into war because he might be killed in the rice paddies. So <laughs> I don't take them seriously. These are the sycophants and the whores of the neocons. They're not relevant. Neither is Hillary, neither is any of the Democrats. What is relevant is what you're beginning to see and not necessarily hear. And what Trump does is to put together the art of the deal. You have to go back to his book to understand that many things that he's going to do, he could not explain it. He couldn't explain to the public that I'm going to strike Syria in order to impress China. 
in order for China to impress North Korea. I don't think most of the press would understand that. I think your audience would understand it. I think you understand it. I think Alex Jones would understand it. But if in any way he was a war hawk, I can assure you I'd be the first one out there along with Alex, along with you, and along with the entire base. But at this particular point, we have an axiom in the intelligence community, which means that there are no accidents. When you see President Xi Jinping literally next to Trump and an airstrike occurs in Syria, it's not relevant to Syria, it's relevant to that president of China. Because China is our primary concern for the next 20 years. The Middle East, we're getting out of the Middle East, thanks to the Elliot Abrams and the Hillary Clintons and the Obamas and the Bush Juniors, they got us into this mess. Trump will try to get us out of the mess, so will our military, not necessarily our CIA, but our military will get us out of the mess and shift us to South China Sea. And that's what I'm telling the audience. If I'm wrong, I will be surprised, but I will say I was wrong. But at this point, I do not think I am wrong. I don't think what Trump did was in any way an act of war as it was a symbol of a strike and the kabuki of war warning Asia that this could happen to you if you don't pay attention and you don't comply with some of the concerns that we have. North Korea is a far greater threat today than it was 20 years ago. And I've worked against the North Koreans. I worked against Kim Jong-un's grandfather, his father, and now him. And if I were given the full authority to take North Korea apart, our military knows what I was capable of doing. So do the Koreans, so do the Chinese. Actually, when I went to China a few years ago, they asked me, was I in China to take them down? I said, no. I'm not in the business right now of regime change. Of course, they knew that was a lie. I could easily work on the business of taking China down because there are issues of water, infrastructure, and communism, capitalism, a whole bunch of conflicting cultural issues which are easy to manipulate in this modern time. But for the present, pay attention to what is not being said and what the art of the deal was all about, and that's what Trump is now about. In terms of Kushner and the other people in the White House, that's almost secondary. That's not relevant. When you hear the noise, that's not where the bang is. The bang is where you don't hear the noise. I understand. So you see this as art of the deal. This is a message to China, as far as you're concerned. And a very interesting perspective. Thank you so much for talking to us, Dr. Steve Pachinik. And, of course, people can find you at stevepachinik.com or also on Twitter at Steve Pachinik. Thank you so much for your views. Thank you, David, and thank you for audience. Thank you.